We're Liz and Dennis, full-time reviewers exploring mainland Mexico for winter in our renovated Class C RV. Cheers. Last week, we made it to Oaxaca City with two of our friends from Europe, Ruth and Rob, trying as much Oaxacan cuisine as we could. This is half. Mm. We visited markets, tried local specialties, Whoa. and even took a traditional Mexican cooking class. Hey. This week, we explore a different side of Oaxaca, getting to know its famous distilled beverage, Mezcal. Salud. Woo! It's good, though. And visit the ancient ruins of Monte Alban. Buenos dias! It's another beautiful day here in Oaxaca and today is an extra special day because we are going on a Mezcal tour with Mezcal Educational Tours. We're going to learn all about the process which is actually way more complex than I originally thought it was about making Mezcal like every step of the way and in we're going to get to try a bunch too so a bunch. <laughs> this video could end very differently than what you see us standing right now. Oaxaca is known for being like the mecca of mezcal. Mezcal is made all throughout Mexico, unlike tequila, which is kind of made in the region of Jalisco. You can find mezcal in several different states, but Oaxaca is lo mejor, is the best. So we're really, really excited to get to drinking. I'm not really a mezcal fan, but I'm hoping this tour will uh, kind of change your mind. I think it's going to change your mind. I hope so. Yeah. So get ready to drink. If you have mezcal at your house, pour some. Unlike tequila, Mexico's famous spirit that is only made from the blue agave plant in the state of Jalisco, mezcal is made from a number of different agave varietals throughout nine different states, giving each batch of mezcal truly unique flavor characteristics provided by the species of agave, distillation process, and skill of the palenquero producing it. Mezcal is mostly produced by small batch palenqueros and is always 100% pure agave a step above tequila, which can be mixed with other grain spirits down to just 51%. Mezcal has deep ties in the Oaxaca region. The areas just outside of Oaxaca City are home to hundreds of different small batch palenques, like the ones we visited on our tour today. Our first stop was Palenque La Descendencia, where we learned how Felix makes mezcal from our tour guide, Alvin. Mi nombre es Félix Ángeles Arianes. Vivo aquí en Santa Catarina, Minas. Soy el dueño del Palenque La Descendencia y los invito a degustar un sabroso mezcal. Pues tengo seis hijos, hombres que trabajan conmigo y tres niñas. The traditional way of making mezcal is to cook the piñas in, a, in an oven in the ground. And this is an oven that's not baking right now, but this was being used up until about four days ago to bake seven or eight tons of agave. It's a conical shaped pit that goes down six or eight feet below where I'm standing. Okay? So you've got an empty pit, you put logs in the bottom of the pit, and then you slowly build a mound of rocks on top of the logs. Once the rocks are really, really hot and there's no flames shooting up, you're ready to bake your agave. Everybody makes a mezcal a little bit differently. They don't read books in almost all cases. You learn from your father and your uncle and your grandfather, but one stage of production that almost everybody uses. If you put the green agave on top of the hot rocks, it's going to burn, okay? So what most people will do is they put a layer of wet discarded fiber from the distillation process. It's called bagasso. So this used to be agave. They put a layer of wet fiber on top of the rocks and then the piñas get put down around there and on top of the bagasso. Some people will put another layer of fiber on top of the piñas and some people won't. Almost everybody will cover up their piñas with tarps and then the dirt around here gets shoveled on top of the dirt and you keep on the shoveling the dirt on until there's no smoke escaping, okay? Because you want it to be an airtight chamber and you're going to leave it like that for about five days. Then after about five days, depending on how many tons and the species of agave, you shovel off the dirt, you take off the tarp and what used to be green piñas are now brown and sweet. You've caramelized the piñas, converted the carbohydrates to sugars. There are three ways of crushing. You can crush it by hand, you can crush it with the horse or the mule or the team of oxen, 
pulling the big wheel around called a tahona, or you can crush it using machinery. Whichever way you crush it, you first have to chop the agave up into little pieces. They'll either use a machete or an axe, or sometimes you can, you, can, you can break it into little pieces by hand. Some people add water as soon as this is crushed. Most people wait a couple of days until this heats up, depending on the ambient temperature. After he adds water, he's going to stir it up with this, and it's going to bubble. And the bubbling is the environmental yeasts interacting with the sweet baked crushed agave that's had water added, and that's the fermentation process. So a cap forms, it turns dark brown, the bubbling subsides, and everything shrinks. Felix makes mezcal differently than many pelenqueros. Instead of using copper distillation, he uses clay pots, a method of making mezcal that was taught to him by his father and grandfather. With this kind of distillation, you need a continuous flow of cold water coming in through there and going out through there. So what's happening right now is the steam is rising, the steam hits the bottom of the condenser, and the drops of liquid fall onto the spoon, and the mezcal drips out over there. After the first distillation, the mezcal doesn't have the complexity or the alcohol content of good mezcal, so it's going to be distilled a second time. And you're going to pitch out the fiber, because you've got to clean out that pot. After everything's been distilled once, you put the single distillate back in the pot, and you start the process all over again. So it's the skill of the maker rather than scientific equipment that is going to determine the quality of the mezcal. So this is the second distillation. Whoa. It's warm, so it's like strong. Espadine is arguably the most popular and commonly produced mezcal, and it's a great place to start for those looking to begin a journey into the wide world of mezcal. But there are several others you'll find on a mezcaleria's menu, like quiche, tobala, and pechuga, a celebratory mezcal which adds chicken or turkey breast with fruits like apples and guava, plus spices like anise and cinnamon, to the second distillation, producing a deliciously complex flavor profile. traditional way of telling alcohol content by looking at the pearless or the bubbles. The longer the bubbles last, the more uniform the size, and the more they comfort together, the higher the alcohol content. If the alcohol content is below about 40 and above about 60, the bubbles dissipate immediately. So he can tell the alcohol content within about one or two points. I'm not a big uh, mezcal, really I'm not a big liquor drinker. I'm just going to preface this. <laughs> Woo! It's good though. Just to let you all know, it is before 12 o'clock. <laughs> this is a, a recipe I, I developed. Yeah. A turkey breast pechuga distilled in copper with uh, Canadian maple syrup and bacon, and it's over 60% alcohol. So give me your cups and we'll sample a little bit. There we go. Okay, oh my god. <laughs> so remember, it's strong, yep. but okay. it's good. Oh, that's good. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Is that a rinse? <laughs> <laughs> Mouthwash. Our next stop was Ramba Mezcal a new palenque that was founded and operated by a woman, a rarity in the world of mezcal. Unlike Felix and other palenques we toured today, Rosario Angeles is a first-generation mezcal maker who learned the art of making mezcal on her own. We live in a community that makes mezcal, so I've always been in the environment of mezcal. And I really love the process of making mezcal. It's all about an art. I do it for love. La primera generación de mi familia, entonces nadie me puso aquí, fue mi decisión y es gusto, placer. Ramba es la diosa del placer y es el placer de hacer mezcal. She wasn't roasting or distilling during our visit, but she let us try a few different types of roasted agave plants, including tobala and espadín, which would begin distilling tomorrow after 10 days of rest outside. Vegetarian beef jerky. Oh yeah. Salud. 
Many people think of mezcal as having a strong, smoky aroma or flavor from the way the agave is cooked, but every mezcal has its own flavor profile, and we were surprised by how many had no smoky notes at all. The final stop on the Mezcal tour was a copper distillation palenque. Alvin explained the difference in distillation processes and as always, we tried a lineup of their different mezcals to see how copper distillation flavors differ greatly from clay. This is what's in the stills now. Oh, actually, it's quite nice. Very soft. Very soft, it's warm, and it has a lot more fruity notes to it. Oh, I actually like this a lot more, I think, than second distillation. Because it's sweet. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> After a lot of mezcal tasting, three different palenques, we're finally grabbing some lunch, which I think is very needed because Dennis might be feeling it. And by might, Dennis is feeling it. What happened? Wait a minute, well, I, I, needed to, I needed to defend myself, which is probably not making the best case. But yes, I have had a lot of mezcal and I am enjoying myself to the fullest. Okay, let's eat. Takalula? Yeah. Dessert? Oh my gosh. So you, you can eat These are huge. Half of that. Each have a half a pound. Oh boy. Oh wow. Oh boy. Wow. So there's chocolate pieces inside, yeah? Yeah. There should be. Buenos dias. We're really sorry about leaving you rather abruptly after our wonderful Mezcal tour, but um It was too fun. <laughs> I think we were feeling it a little bit, some more than others. I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but I had a lot of fun. It was like a seven or eight hour tour. And if you are coming to Oaxaca, I definitely suggest taking a Mezcal tour. Alvin with Mezcal Educational Tours was awesome. He was so knowledgeable and it was really nice to have an English speaker to kind of be able to explain the process. Alvin is super passionate about how Mezcal is made and the people who are making it. So he has built personal relationships with these palenqueros. So you get a really intimate vibe when you're out on tour with him. And one thing that we really, really liked about Mezcal Educational Tours in particular compared to some of the other groups that you can take tours with is that he's not doing this for profit. He's retired, he's doing it because he loves it. He actually takes any proceeds from a tour that he gets and donates it to help put people in small villages through school. He actually has helped a woman from a really small town just outside of Oaxaca go all the way to medical school and she's in the process of getting her doctorate degree. So right. you're doing good by participating and you get to have fun and learn something. So we highly recommend taking that tour. It was so much fun. We did have to say goodbye to our wonderful friends. It's been fun. Bye. 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 Thanks for everything guys. Bye. Goodbye guys. Bye. Ruth and Rob, we love you guys. Thank you so much for having so much fun with us this past week and, and going on exciting adventures. Yep. We can't wait to see you again, hopefully sure. in Europe. Today is our last day here in Wakaka, so we are making the most of it. We came to a pyramid that is open. Yay. So we hopped on a Colectivo, which cost us a whopping 18 pesos for the two of us. It took us into the center of town where we got a bus to Monte Alban, and we are going to be exploring this beautiful pyramid. Monte Alban archeological site, as it's known today, was once the capital for the Zapotec or Cloud Peoples, who inhabited this area for over 13 centuries, from 500 BC to 800 AD. Series of great plazas, temples, pyramids, and Tlachli courts, a popular ball game, are perfectly positioned between several valleys with breathtaking views of the mountains and the surrounding area all around. As beautiful as the views are from above, below the ancient city is a series of intricate passageways and nearly 170 tombs. The Zapotec were a very sophisticated society that was closely in tune with the sky. Their deep understanding of astrology guided the evolution of their civilization. They developed tools that revealed the time of day or approaching seasons using only the sun and had their own 260-day calendar system. 
There were many glyphs throughout the ruins that illustrated life during their rise to power as a dominating civilization in the area. A wall on the astrology pyramid is covered with images of warriors with upside down heads, each representing a conquest that was made. After the Spanish conquest in the 15th century, the Mixtec inhabited this site, and certain glyphs found here give evidence that the Olmec and other pre-Hispanic cultures inhabited or influenced the area at one point in time. I'm like a kid in a candy store, I don't know which way to go. This is so amazing. Oh, what did you do today on your Tuesday? Just visited some ancient pyramids, Mexico. I love this life. The album, que padre o no. We're gonna start an eagle scale of coolness. And Monte Alban is the first archeological site that we visited that's gonna get five out of five eagles. So that means it's definitely worth coming and checking out. I would say that this is equally as cool as Teotihuacan, but in a very different way. The location is what makes this place super rad. It was only 80 pesos per person to get in, plus we brought the GoPro. So it was an extra 45 pesos so we could record this video basically. Come here for sure. So we've been keeping something from you. The X-Max has been down for like three weeks. We haven't been riding it at all. Pretty much the entire time we've been in Mexico except for short sprints because it's doing exactly the same thing it was doing the first time we came into Mexico, which was not recharging the battery. We thought we had the problem solved the first time when we got it fixed in Icatepec but it wasn't the only problem. Apparently it was a compound thing and it wasn't just the plug that the guy thought was dirty. So now that we're in Oaxaca, Alvin clued us into his favorite Moto Servicio or motorcycle shop, which is Moto Servicio Maiko. These guys have had the X-Max for the last week and they've done everything. They've changed the regulator, which was the actual charging problem. Checked out the spark plugs, checked out the stator, everything's good. They did a full fluid service on it. Long story short, I'm super happy to have my own way of transportation back. That way we can just hop on the scooter whenever we want to, not have to try to find a collectivo or an auto bus or pay a huge taxi fare. So, freedom! <laughs> We finished the night off getting tostillas quites, a popular street food that adds elote on top of flavored tostitos. Not exactly healthy, but uh, really delicious. You literally said when I said I wanted this, and you read the ingredients on the bag, that you were not going to touch it. I didn't say I wasn't going to touch it, I just it. looked disgusted at it. And half the bag. I'm hungry. After a quick snack, we headed to Los Desantes, one of the best restaurants and mezcalerias in Oaxaca City, where we had an amazing meal. So as we're packing up to leave today to head to our next destination, we wanted to give you a little tour of this wonderful RV park. They have a communal area that has a kitchen, a pool, TV, like lounge area, and tables to eat. It's where we had our Thanksgiving dinner. The bathrooms are really nice. Really clean showers with hot water. They also have bikes that you can use to get around town. And I think the best part is that they have recycling. It's our first RV park that has had recycling in all of Mexico. Plus, they have a washing machine in case you want to do laundry. 50 pesos and they hang dry on a line outside. It's pretty awesome. You don't even have to go anywhere. It is properly wired so it's got grounds and everything so you're not going to have hot skin problems. But the breakers are large for the plugs that you're going to be having to use the plug in. So it's a 15 amp plug but it has a 30 amp breaker. What that means is you're going to be able to suck a lot more power than the adapter you're going to be using with your RV can actually handle. So you will melt either the outlet or the adapter before the breaker will trip. Now that probably won't cause any major damage inside of the RV. Basically what I'm saying is 
don't use more than one heavy appliance at a time even though it has a 30 amp breaker because that's dangerous. Everything was really nice and grassy with uh, really level spots. And this was the first RV park where we actually had a lot of other RVers. It's a, it's a busy little hub. Yeah, it's a nice little community here and we're right in the city of Santa Maria Tule, which is about a 20 minute drive into the centro. There's collectivos and buses that come in and out as well as taxis. If you have your own transportation, it's really easy to get into the center. We just kept extending our stays. We're like, let's just stay one more night. Let's just stay one more night. Also, the Wi-Fi here is blazing. blazing. Upload speeds and download speeds are out of this world. Best Wi-Fi we've had. It's incredible. Oh yeah. We'll leave a link to this exact spot below but I think we're gonna leave you here and we'll pick you up next week if you like the video of course like and subscribe why not helps us out it's we'll free for you it helps us out we'll see you next week adios beautiful pyramid from the Zapotec culture natives culture it works the Zapotec culture it's not like it's gone, it's still a culture. I don't really know, you you, you read the Google, so. <laughs> and we did a little research on the bus ride here to find out what we're gonna be seeing. Some of these rigs are insane. Most of them are from Germany. They're like tanks. There's a few people who have been living out of them for seven to 10 years. Pretty awesome. The horse gets attached to the tohona and the horse, oh, the horse drags it and that's how it gets crushed. The horse dragging, the tohona over the agave. And when the agave is crushed, they pitch it from here into a vat. All of this.